Hello there. Today, I want to try and explain to you what I believe the man-child is in Revelation chapter 12, verse 5. There's been a lot of references to this lately. And um, I did do a video not long ago explaining what I believe the woman was, what the 12 stars represented, what the sun represented, and what the moon represented. Uh, but in this video now, I want to just specifically look at the man-child. Uh, most people believe this is the church and it's a simple pre-tribulation rapture. But I think it's a little more complicated than that. And you have to go in depth and you have to look at a lot of the scriptures. But before we do that, let me just explain to you uh, what we got from the first video. If you didn't see it, please go and take a look and you'll understand how it comes from scripture. The woman was the heavenly Jerusalem in Hebrews 12.22, Galatians 4.26. Travailing in birth was to produce the spirit of Christ in her children, Galatians 4.19. The son represented Israel, taken from the interpretation of Joseph's dream in Genesis 37.10. The moon represented Rachel in Joseph's dream and the people of the land in Matthew 2, verse 18. The 12 stars represented the 12 tribes of Israel, also taken from Joseph's dream, seen on the head of the woman, which is symbolically Mount Zion, in Revelation 14, 1. So that's what we gleaned out of the first video. And now let's go and take a look and see what we can find out about this man-child. Uh, so go to Revelation chapter 12, verse 5. And she brought forth a son, who is about to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Now, there's two words here, son and child. And there are two attributes of this son. Uh, number one, it's going to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And number two, it's going to be caught up to God and to his throne. And because of these two attributes, uh, many people believe it refers to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, because it does say about him that he's going to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And it does say he's going to be caught up to the throne. And this is the scriptures that they use to prove it. Psalm 2, verse 6. Yet I have set my king upon my holy mount of Zion. I will declare the decree of Yahweh. He said to me, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Now when Peter preached in Acts 13, verse 33, uh, he referred to this as the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, so we know this is referring to Jesus. Today I have begotten you referred to his resurrection. Verse 8. Ask of me and I shall give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall smash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. There's your rod of iron. Uh, and that's just the one scripture from the Old Testament. We go now and we'll see one in the New Testament which says the same thing. Revelation 19.15 And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads the winepress of the fury and wrath of Almighty God. So this is obviously referring to the Lord Jesus Christ because later in that chapter it talks about the beast being taken and cast into the lake of fire. And he did get caught up to heaven. We can see this in Acts chapter 1. Verse 9, And when he had said these things, while they watched, he was lifted up and a cloud took him up out of their sight. When Peter preached on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2 verse 33, he said that Jesus was at the right hand of God. So we know he was caught up to heaven, to God's throne. 
Now, those are the reasons why people believe uh, that this referred to the Lord Jesus Christ. But there are some reasons why it doesn't refer to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I just want to mention two of those. If you re interpret Jesus as literally being the man-child, then you have to interpret the one as literally being Mary. Now, Mary was never clothed with the sun. She's never said to have the moon under her feet. And Mary is never said to have a garland of 12 stars around her head. The, the thing is obviously figurative. It's not literal. We're not talking about a literal person here. And we're not talking about a literal woman here. Uh, and this is the problem with that interpretation of it being Jesus Christ. The second reason is, if you go to Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, it says, After these things I saw and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as of a trumpet talking with me, saying, Come up here and I will show you things which must happen after these things. After these things refers to what happened uh, or was written in Revelation 1, 2 and 3. Uh, so unless we can find some very good evidence somewhere in Scripture to prove otherwise, I would take everything after Revelation 4, 1 as being future from the time of John's prophecy. Now there is another reference in Scripture to someone ruling the nations with a rod of iron. So let's go and take a look at that. Revelation 2 verse 26 And he who overcomes and who keeps my works to the end, to him will I give authority over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter are being broken to pieces, as I also receive from my Father. So Jesus said the uh, people who believed in him, the ones who overcame, they also would rule all nations with a rod of iron. Uh, and we have to ask ourselves the question, uh, how did they overcome? Uh, and Jesus himself gives us the answer. Revelation 3.21 To him who overcomes I will give to sit with me in my throne even as I also overcame and sat down with my father in his throne. So the overcomers are going to overcome the same way Jesus overcame. And we have to ask ourselves two questions. What did they overcome and how did they overcome it? And to do this, we can go and look at the example of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. In John 16, verse 33, he said, I have overcome the world. So let's ask, how did Jesus overcome the world if this is what we have to overcome? And what does it mean to overcome the world? We can find the first clue to this uh, in Luke chapter 4, verse 5. And the devil, leading him up into a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, I will give you all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and to whoever I will, I give it. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all shall be yours. And answering him, Jesus said, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Now what more can you offer anybody in the world than all the kingdoms of the world? Everything that the world could offer, the, the wealth, uh, the power, the admiration of people, everything that the world seeks after, all these things you would get if you became the king of the world. But Jesus refused it. He overcame the world 
by not wanting any part of the world. That's one of the ways in which he overcame it. Now it seems that this temptation may have been very real because in 2 Corinthians 4.4 4, um, it refers to Satan as the god of this world. And in Revelation chapter 30 verse 2 and verse 7 it says that Satan has actually given all this authority over all the kingdoms of the world to the Antichrist. So um, it wasn't. It doesn't seem like it was a fake temptation and Satan wasn't really offering him something that he didn't have. So go to Matthew chapter 8 verse 19 then. And one scribe came and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus says to him, The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. So it seems from this scripture that Jesus is saying he didn't own anything in this world. Uh, possessions in this world were not on his itinerary. What Jesus was about was simply doing the will of God. Matthew 19.21 Jesus says to him, that's the rich young ruler who came to him, if you desire to be perfect, go and sell your goods and give to the poor and you shall have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. Uh, this young man had uh, a wealth of possessions and Jesus told him to sell them and uh, give to the poor, help the poor people. And of course in the book of Acts we see this acted out in Acts chapter 2. And in Acts chapter 4, we see people who came to be part of the church, selling their lands and their houses and laying the money at the apostles' feet so that um, distribution could be made to the poor people. Now the apostle Paul also had this same attitude. We can see this in the book of Galatians, chapter 6, verse 14. But let it not be that I should glory except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. It seems then that the Apostle Paul was crucified to the world. That would mean he's dead to it. In other words, it doesn't affect him. The things of the world weren't a bother to him. First John 2.15 do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. So the Apostle John had the same attitude, don't love the things of the world, don't covet possessions in the world. Um, it seems like uh, if you really want to serve God and do his will, you're not really going to be requiring things of the world. James put it in, in an extremely strong way. James chapter 4 verse 4, adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. So what we have here is James speaking in extremely strong language. Friendship of the world, enmity with God. And I, I don't think any Christian would really want to be in that situation. Um, but if that's what you want, then you have to shed your interest in the things of the world. The power, the admiration, the finances, everything that the world has to offer, this is only temporary, uh, and you have to be prepared to give it up. Uh, the Apostle Paul also said in Galatians 5.24, Those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. It's crucifixion of the flesh. The flesh here in this scripture is spiritual. It's talking about 
the old man, the body of the old man, the flesh of the old man. It's talking about crucifying your evil desires, whatever they are. It's talking about putting sin to death. It's talking about your desire for the things of the world, putting those to death. That's what the Apostle Paul was referring to. So let's go and take a look at another attribute of these overcomers now. And we'll move on from there. Revelation 2 verse 8 And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things says the first and the last who was dead and came alive. I know your works and your tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison that you may be tested, and you shall have tribulation ten days. Be faithful to death, and I will give you a crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall surely not be hurt of the second death. Now in this scripture, there are three things it seems that the people did to overcome. They suffered, they went through tribulation, and eventually they died. They were executed for not giving up their testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, this kind of thing is said in other places also. Revelation 12 verse 10, And I heard a loud voice in heaven, Now has come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers has been cast out, who was accusing them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. When the devil is cast out in Revelation 12, uh, he goes to persecute the man-child. He's trying to devour it, it says. And this is how he's doing it. He's persecuting uh, God's people, these overcomers. He's, he's putting them to death. And it says they overcame him by not loving their lives to the death. Revelation 14, 12. Here is the endurance of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. Blessed are those who die in the Lord. That means in Christ. This is the church. This is the Christian people. Uh, they're going here and they are being persecuted and they are killed and they are not giving up their testimony. They die in the Lord. Revelation 15, 1. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them the wrath of God was completed. And I saw like a sea of glass mixed with fire, and the overcomers of the beast and of his image and of his mark and of the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having the harps of God, and they sing the song of Moses, a servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvellous are your works, Lord God Almighty, righteous and true are your ways, King of Saints. Now these overcomers, these are the ones who overcame the mark of the beast and the number of his name, uh, so they're the ones who were here during the tribulation while the beast was on the earth and it seems obvious that they were killed for their testimony because they're standing on a sea of glass and the sign, the verse 1 said it's in heaven. 
So these are not people who are alive on the earth. Look at another scripture. Revelation 20 verse 4. I saw thrones and they sat on them and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God and who not worship the beast nor his image nor received his mark upon their foreheads or on their hand. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So here again we see uh, godly people beheaded for the witness of Jesus. They overcame the mark of the beast. They didn't receive his mark. They didn't worship his image. These are people who are going to be killed during the great tribulation when the Antichrist is trying to exterminate the Christians. So this is one way in which people overcome. They overcome uh, by dying for their testimony. It may not happen to everybody, but it's certainly going to happen to some. We've read the scriptures which prove it. Let's go and take another look now at how uh, another attribute of these overcomers. Revelation 3 verse 4. You have a few names in Sardis who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white because they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Now in this scripture it says that those who overcome are going to be dressed in white robes. And we've seen this elsewhere, haven't we, in the previous video. Revelation chapter 6 verse 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they were crying with a loud voice, saying, Until when, O Master, holy and true, do you not judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And white robes were given to each of them. And it was said to them that they should rest yet for a little time until their fellow servants also and their brothers, who were about to be killed as they were, shall be fulfilled. So these souls under the altar, figurative perhaps of a sacrificed life, these were given white robes to wear, exactly the same as the overcomers. Revelation 7 verse 9 After these things I looked and behold a great crowd which no one was able to number out of every nation and tribe and peoples and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Verse 13 And one of the elders answered saying to me who are these who are arrayed in white robes, and where did they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are those who came out of the great tribulation, and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. The great tribulation is what it says in the Greek. Uh, it doesn't say that in the King James, but in other Bibles, in some other Bibles it does. So these were people who went through the Great Tribulation and they were killed during the Tribulation because these are people now who are standing before the throne of God in heaven. And of course that's where uh, the spirits of righteous people go, isn't it? Now in Revelation 12, 11 it says that they overcame the devil by the blood of the Lamb. And this scripture also says uh, that they washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So let's explain what that means. In Leviticus chapter 17, verse 10 to 14, it talks about uh, no man shall eat any blood. The life of the flesh is in the blood. Uh, the blood is the life of all flesh. The blood makes atonement for the soul, therefore no man shall eat any blood. Uh, so 
It tells us from this scripture, if you think about it, that the spiritual significance of the blood is the life. And this is exactly what I believe it's referring to here. In Romans chapter 5, verse 9, it says, We are justified by his blood. And in Romans chapter 5, verse 10, it says we are saved by his life. So whether you're saved by his life or by his blood, effectively, it means the same thing. 1 John 1, verse 7 says, If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of his Son, Jesus Christ, cleanses us from all sin. To walk in the light as Jesus is in the light, you have to have the Spirit of Christ in you, which gives you the life of Christ. And that is exactly what's referred to here. Uh, to overcome by the blood means to live the life. You have the life of Christ, and then you will be like him. So let's go and have a look at another scripture. Revelation 19 verse 7 We should rejoice and be glad and give glory to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was given that she should be clothed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he says to me, Right, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he says to me, These words of God are true. Now this is the Lamb's wife, the church, which has made herself ready, clothed in fine linen, clean and bright. These are the white robes that have been given to the overcomers. And we know this is Revelation chapter 19 is about the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because later in the chapter, in verse 19 to 20, it tells you that the beast is taken and cast into the lake of fire. So this is actually referring to the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I will remind you of one thing here also. Go back to Revelation chapter 12 verse 3. And it says, And another sign was seen in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and cast them onto the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. The dragon's purpose here was to devour the child, the man-child, as soon as it was born. And this is what he does. He devours the man-child. He uses the Antichrist to persecute and, and kill the Christians who are left on the earth. This is how he's going to devour the man-child. If you don't believe the, uh, the Christians are going to be overpowered by the Antichrist, Take a look at these scriptures. Daniel 7, 21. I looked on the same horn, referring to the Antichrist right there, made war with the saints and prevailed against them until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. So in this scripture, we see the, the, the Antichrist making war with the saints and overcoming them. Uh, there's going to be plenty of saints down here on the earth in the time of the Antichrist, and this is the ones that he's going to make war against. Look at another scripture. Revelation 11, 7. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast who ascends out of the abyss shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. This is referring to the two prophets who are prophesying in Jerusalem in the very last days. I believe these two prophets will be the ones who turn Israel back to God. Uh, but they're killed by the beast and uh, their bodies lie in, in, the, uh, 
in the streets for three and a half days and then they're resurrected and they're taken up to heaven. Uh, you can read this in Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 13 verse 7. It was given to him to make war with the saints and overcome them. And authority was given to him over every tribe and tongue and nation. This is referring to the Antichrist who is killing off the Christians in the last days. Authority is given to him over all the world. It says all the world shall worship him. And this is what you've got in the last days. The saints are going to be here, but they're going to be persecuted and they're going to be killed. So let's go now and look at another type of the church. We know in Revelation chapter 19, it refers to the Lamb's wife uh, and the bride of Christ, uh, which is a female, but that's not the only typology that we have for the church of God. In 1 Peter chapter 2, for example, verse 5, uh, it's talked about as being living stones in a building. Um, and uh, that's built up to give praise to God. In Colossians 1, verse 18, it says, And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, and he being first in all things. Verse 24, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the tribulations of Christ in my flesh for his body, which is the church. So twice in this scripture, uh, Paul refers to the church as the body of Christ. This is another typology uh, of what the church is. And of course, um, if you put the spirit of Christ into the body of Christ, you're going to end up with a man. Uh, and I believe in, in this is what the male child is. This body of Christ is made up of many members. We can see this in Romans chapter 12, verse 4. For as we have many members in one body, and all members do not have the same function, so also... We are the many members, one body in Christ, and every one members of each other. 1 Corinthians 12.12 12, For as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether we are Jews or Gentiles, whether we are bond or free, we have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. Amen. The church is likened to the body of Christ. And we can see uh, another place where it refers to and explains to us exactly what I believe the man child is now. Go to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. Therefore, remember how you were once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hand, that you were at that time without Christ, being alienated from the citizenship of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were far off have become near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of the fence between us. Having annulled in his flesh the enmity, the Lord of commandments and ordinances, so as to create in himself of the two one new man, soul making peace. That one new man there that we've heard mentioned, I believe that is the man child, the male child that is referred to in Revelation chapter 12 verse 5. Caught up to God and to his throne. It's made up of Jews and Gentiles, all baptized into the body of Christ 
and becoming Christ-like. Individual members of the body of Christ, filled with the Spirit of Christ, makes up a typology of an image or a replica of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. This is what the church is meant to be. Now, there are a couple of objections that you can make to this. And the first one is that in Revelation 12, 5, it refers to a child, not a fully mature man. And the other objection is that the word harpazo is used, caught up. This is exactly the same uh, verb that is used concerning the rapture of the church in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 17. And so people hang on to this view that this is referring to the rapture of the church. Uh, so let me deal with these two points and explain these. The word translated son in Revelation 12.5 is the Greek word huios, Strong's number 5207. It often refers to full-grown men, not always literal sons, Jesus is called the son of David in various scriptures. Jesus is called the son of God in various scriptures. People are called sons of God in various scriptures. Israelites are called children of Israel in a number of scriptures. And in Acts chapter 13 verse 10, Elimas the sorcerer is called son of the devil. In many places, these are not literal sons, as we would understand the word, they mean descendants. And in some cases, they're spiritual sons. The word translated child in Revelation 12 verse 5 is the Greek word technon. Strong's number is 5043. This often refers to full grown people, not always literal children. People are referred to as sons or children of God in various scriptures. Israelites are called children of Abraham. Paul referred to his spiritual sons, Timothy, Titus and Onesimus in Philemon. Uh, people are called sons of the devil in 1 John 3 verse 10. So these are not literal sons either. These can be fully grown people or again they can refer to spiritual somebody who's spiritual son. Now in the first video that we did uh, we referred to Isaiah 66 verse 7 where it talks about a man child being born. And uh, this particular word translated male in the Hebrew is Zakar, Strong's 2145, often refers to full-grown people or animals, not always literal children, refers to Adam when he was created, refers to Israelite priests in Leviticus, refers to animals going into Noah's Ark, refers to animal sacrifices also in a number of places. So these words are not literal sons in every place and neither does it literally mean a son as like a little child in Revelation 12.5. It's referring to a fully grown body of Christ. Concerning the verb arpazo being used. This word occurs 13 times in the New Testament. And it's used in various different contexts. It doesn't always mean the same thing in every place. It refers to the rapture in 1 Thessalonians 4.17, but in other places it's used in a far different sense. Matthew 11.12, it talks of the kingdom of God being taken by force. In John chapter 10, verse 28 to 29, it refers to uh, somebody being plucked out of the hand of Jesus or plucked out of the hand of the Father. It, the word means to snatch or to seize. That's what it, what it is. It's, it's a violent kind of word. In Acts chapter 8 verse 39, 
it refers to Philip being snatched away after uh, he administered to the Ethiopian eunuch. And in Jude 23, it refers to people being pulled out of the fire. Uh, it depends on the context as to what this word means. You can't force it to mean one thing in a particular place just because it means that in another place. Uh, you've got to look at the context. And this is what you have to do in Revelation chapter 12, verse 5. In 2 Corinthians 12, 2, it says, I know a man in Christ 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, or out of the body I do not know, God knows, such a one caught up to the third heaven. And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body I do not know, God knows, that he was caught up into paradise. And he heard unspeakable words, which it is not permitted for a man to speak. So it appears from this scripture that Paul thought it perfectly possible for a person to be caught up to heaven out of the body, i.e. his spirit to be caught up to heaven, to paradise, to the third heaven. That's exactly where the throne of God is. And this is what I believe is happening in the last days uh, through the persecution of the church as soon as the, the saints die. They're being caught up to heaven. They're going to paradise, to the third heaven, to where the throne of God is. When Jesus was crucified on the cross in Luke 23, verse 43, he said to uh, the malefactor on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise. Uh, and in verse 46, he, when he died, he said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. So this is the situation that you've got. When a person dies righteous in Christ, they go to be with God. They're caught up to heaven. And of course, we see this also in other scriptures. Revelation 6, verse 9 to 11, the souls under the altar, they were up in heaven. Revelation 7, verse 9, uh, these were an innumerable company of people out of all nations standing before the throne of God, came out of the great tribulation. Revelation 14, 1, 144,000 uh, Israelites standing on the Mount Zion. The one in heaven, the sign was in heaven. It was before the throne of God in verse 3 and verse 5. But in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22, we have confirmation of these spirits going to heaven. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to myriads of angels, to the whole assembly and church of the firstborn who are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of righteous men made perfect. This scripture tells us that the spirits of righteous men are in heaven, the church of the firstborn. This is where all saved Christians go when they die. What a wonderful thing to look forward to. Friend, this is what I believe the man-child is. It's a complete body of Christ. Uh, an image of the Lord Jesus Christ, each individual member filled with the Spirit of Christ, and when they're persecuted and die for what they believe, um, then they are taken up to be in heaven. Uh, remember that the purpose of the dragon in Revelation 12 verse 3 was to persecute and get rid of the man-child. Uh, so that's what I believe it is. I just want to say to you before I go, take heed that no man deceives you. Uh, for many false prophets have gone out into the world and shall deceive many. And Jesus also said, if the blind lead the blind, both fall in the ditch. My friend, search things out for yourself. Compare scripture with scripture. Don't accept everything that a person tells you. Don't either 
try to make it fit what you want. Uh, this is not a popular doctrine what I'm teaching here. I didn't get it lightly. I Every time I've been before God and asked him, uh, I've said to him, I want to know the truth, whether I like it or not, I'm asking you to show me the truth. I can't remember one occasion when I ever got the answer I wanted. It was always what I didn't want. But this is what it means to die to self. Give up all your selfish desires. My advice to everybody is to prepare for what is to come. The pre-tribulation rapture never happens. It isn't going to happen. Uh, if you believe in that, you want it to happen, I understand why you want it to happen. I wish the thing were true, but it isn't. It is better if you prepare yourself and make yourself ready uh, because the day is coming when the Antichrist is going to appear and you're going to realize you've been deceived. I do hope you've got something out of this Bible study. And if you have, please give God all the glory. Thank you very much for watching and God bless you in Jesus' name. Click center to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Click top right to see more videos and go to our website to see great Bible studies, Hebrew and Greek word studies and lots more. And God bless you.